Hi everyone, welcome to another AP Environmental Science Lecture. Today we're going to look at um, ocean currents and we've already seen that unequal heating of the earth together along with the Coriolis effect drive the air currents around the world. And it's these two phenomena are also going to affect ocean currents as well. So in this lecture what we're going to look at is the circulation of ocean waters both at the surface and in the deep ocean and we're also going to see how o ocean circulation affects the transport of heat around the globe and in turn how this heat movement affects the climates of continents and how disruptions to these circulation patterns can dramatically alter global climates. So by the end of this lecture you should be able to describe the pattern of, of ocean circulation, explain the mixing of surface and deep ocean waters from thermohaline circulations, and identify the causes and consequences of El Nino, where we refer to it as the southern oscillation. So to get going, first we're going to look at the surface currents, and this is obviously at the top of the water column of the ocean. And what these are responsible for, they move warm and cold water around the globe. And if we look a little closer, the red arrows being the warm surface currents, the blue being the red, or the blue being the cold, I'm sorry, you'll notice that just as in air, warm water displaces cold water and vice versa giving us our circulation of all the five major ocean basins. So on a large scale pattern, we see this pattern of circulation where in the northern hemisphere, these gyres are moving in a clockwise formation. As you can see in the North Pacific or the North Atlantic, it's going clockwise. Whereas southern hemisphere, these um, gyres are moving counterclockwise. And again, as we mentioned, just as in air, as warm air wants to rise, it's the same as with water. So warm air wanting to rise, cold air sinking, and as a result, we have these currents that are driven not just by this distribution of different temperature of water, but we also have temperature involved, uh, especially in regards to temperature, the differential heating, we've all learned that you know, we get more direct sun rays nearer at the equator compared to the uh, poles and further mid-latitudes. So that differential temperature is going to result in our currents along with gravity, the prevailing winds, the Coriolis effect, and even the continents come into play. So we call these five major ocean basins, this circulation, we call these gyres. And they're mostly driven by those prevailing winds in the tropics <clears throat> the trade winds in the tropics and the westerlies in the mid-latitudes. And here we can see again that if you were to look at your wind um, chart or the picture you drew that remember the winds are the way they, they are flowing in the north and south uh, southern hemispheres you can see they have a direct result on the path of the currents as well. So again remember the trade winds coming from um, just south of Spain here the trade winds are blowing the same direction as this current and the same as the westerlies pushing back towards uh, Europe. So again, the ocean currents are directly involved with the surface winds. So again, as we mentioned, uh, warm water rises, cold air sinks. We call this upwelling. And what's happening here is you can see where it's two where two currents are diverging or separating. So if we look closer, so for example here the equatorial countercurrent, as it diverges, part of it goes north, the other is going south. We have upwelling off the coast of uh, California and the Baja of California. We have upwelling off the west coast of Africa and so on. And what this upwelling does though, it's important to mention, is that this deep ocean water as it moves upward, the water is bringing nutrients from the bottom of the ocean, which in turn support large numbers of producers. So here you can see in the picture you have these, this cold water, and this is a perfect example where the continents are coming into play. The cold water is traveling beneath the ocean. It hits the, the continent and rises, it upwells, and as a result brings lots of nutrients for producers. Remember, producers are photosynthetic. In this case, it would be phytoplankton, algae. But this is providing a large food source for many other fish and animals. So where we see upwelling, we usually see quite a bit of marine life. And um, up here in Point Arena near the Farallon Islands off California is a great example of all the life it can uh, sustain. 
Moving forward, we're going to look at thermohaline circulation. And thermohaline, easy to remember it is when you see thermo, I want you to think temperature and haline, just think of salt. So halite, the mineral halite, is a combination of sodium and chloride, again, which is just salt. So this circulation is dependent on temperature and salt content. So you have this mixing of temperatures, you have this mixing of different types of salt, and it's going to drive surface waters. And what happens is, is in the North Atlantic, we'll look at it closer here. If we look at number one, we have very warm water coming from the Gulf of Mexico towards the North Atlantic. And what happens here at number one near the Gulf is water from the Gulf of Mexico to the North Atlantic is either going to freeze or evaporate. Important to point out, it's the water that is freezing or it's the water that's evaporating. Whatever salt was in that water that is evaporated or froze stays in the ocean. So what we see are these increasing uh, salt concentrations of water and cold, salty water is very dense. So what happens, therefore, that water starts it begins to sink, mixing with this deeper ocean. So this salt, round number two, that salty water begins to sink and that combination of salt increased salt and sinking creates the movement necessary to drive a deep cold current that slowly moves past Antarctica and then back up into the northern Pacific this takes an extremely long time but again it is a current and it is a process and it plays a huge role in circulation of the ocean And there you can see how we already mentioned you have the same deal. You have the red is the surface flow and the thermohaline. That's when the blue is involved. And again, it's that evaporation, increased salt, uh, decreased temperature. So, and you can see here it takes this KYR, that's, it takes about 1,000 years to go one loop. So imagine water starting up in the uh, North Atlantic. It will take about 1,000 years to get back to that location. And this is a great uh, picture here showing you how, and you can all imagine the equator is running somewhere around here. We have warm temperatures, and the more red, the more salt there is, which makes sense because you can assume there's a lot of evaporation going on near the tropics and straddling the equator. So the higher salt content is going to result in denser water denser ocean water where it sinks in the North Atlantic. We're going to finish off the lecture referring to the El Nino or what we normally call it is the Southern Oscillation. It's called the El Nino because it usually happens at or near around uh, Christmas, December 25th. So El Nino is the child and um, that's where it gets the name El Nino. But every three to seven years, there's this interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean, which causes surface currents in the tropical Pacific to all of a sudden reverse direction. So if we look up here at a normal year, we have our normal circulation. We'll, the cold water will leave go west from South America towards Australia and Indonesia and so on. But what happens here in an El Nino year, trade winds drop and that warm surface water starts to flow eastward. And now we're bringing warm water uh, sea currents to replace the once cold water along the South American coast. So as we mentioned, all of a sudden these ocean currents are going to shift. Instead of going to west in an El Nino year, they're going to move to the east. And as you mentioned as well, the, those trade winds are weakened, which cause, allows this to happen. So warm waters build up along the Peruvian coast and as a result we notice this and remember cold water is bringing lots of nutrients to an area so in years past where maybe you might have been able to uh, catch an abundance of fish off the South American coast in El Nino years very dry not a lot of uh, producers for the fish or other animals to eat so we notice a drop in marine life during those years as well. So how this happens is first what's going to happen is we have our trade winds that here we have them moving from an area of high pressure to low near the equator. Remember they're being diverted due to the Coriolis effect to the left. So what happens is these trade winds weaken 
which allows a change in the warm water from the equatorial region to move now that was once moving west to now move towards the South America. So here's our warm water moving towards South America rather than away. So again, this suppresses that upwilling that I already mentioned, reducing fish populations and, you know, there's a whole trickle effect between the trophic pyramid and the uh, food web during those years. And here's just another way to look at it. We do have um, certain things that will happen throughout the year. There will be usually um, changes in weather patterns all throughout the, uh, the world. The southeast of the United States will usually have less precipitation and so on. So it's not just an, uh, um, an effect just for the Peruvian or South American or equatorial regions. There's a lot that goes on. And here we can see just going back to 1965 that our red are our El Nino years. And again, this usually happens about on average between two to seven years. So that'll wrap up our lecture on ocean currents. If there's anything, always shoot me an email or come see me in class.